thank you, Hillary. It's really lovely to be here this evening and, um, and to witness all of the leadership that brings a conference like this together. So really grateful for our student leadership and, and for all of you for attending, because I, I, I believe leadership happens in each one of us and being committed to um, coming together and participating in this evening. This is Elon's eighth Ripple Conference, um, which is really, uh, I remember the first one, so it feels like in a flash, we're, we're here with our eighth one. Uh, and the goal was a vision around coming together. When you think about having a life of meaning, then immediately you think about purpose, right? Having a life of purpose. Um, and I do think that one of the great things that happens is not only are we sharing um, uh, listening and to each other's uh, faith experience in this conference, but we're often sharing our own journeys. And I have found in my own learning that when I am sharing about something I've learned, I, it is helping me learn, right? That reflection of when I'm sharing actually is a, is a reinforcement and, and it, 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 that reflection has me changing um, and, and, and learning new things about myself. So I hope that that's the experience that you have as well, that um, through this new uh, engagement this over the weekend, uh, that you will learn something about others and also something about yourself. And, and what I appreciate about the Ripple Conference is they don't take on um, the small and unimportant topic. <laughs> they, they dive right into the, the difficult, challenging topics that uh, that were, were surround us. So they have had conferences in the past and, and elements of this conference too around social justice, around diversity, around response, human responsibility and integrity and all of the ways in which we participate as citizens and uh, in, in, in how interfaith is, uh, is built into that. And I'm also grateful that we started this conference this evening with Shabbat rest, <laughs> as the rabbi reminded us. Uh, and Shabbat, uh, as a Catholic who's attended a few Shabbats, one of the, I love the, the singing, I love the prayer. Um, and it also is a way after a long and hectic week um, to pause and think about gratitude and, um, and to prepare for uh, a weekend ahead. Um, so very appreciative. So I, uh, this evening, have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Anthony um, Cruz Pantojas, who is a humanist chaplain at Tufts University in Boston. And I shared that I, was, I had never encountered a humanist. I wasn't familiar with humanism. And so I had to do a little reading to prepare to understand Anthony's role and to understand the humanist uh, curriculum. So in that role, Anthony, as, as the humanist chaplain at Tufts, Anthony supports the development and sustainability of ethical inquiry through co-constructed projects with the campus community. So working with others, attaching um, to others in, in, a, in a collateral space. Um, as an endorsed humanist celebrant and chaplain by the Humanist Society, Anthony works at the intersection of ethics constructive theologies and decolonial orientations to culture to understand the human condition. Their queer Afro, and uh, you go ahead and say it for us, Anthony. What? Bo, bo, bor, bor, equa, bor, equa, bor equa. Uh, Afro-Boricua identity also deeply informs their engagement with ethics and relationality. They've received grants focusing on humanist inquiry and publish regularly. Anthony has earned his master's, uh, has earned the master's degree in theological studies and leadership and humanist studies from Andover Newton Theological School and Meadville Lombard Theological School, respectively. Additionally, they hold a graduate certificate in humanist studies from the American Humanist Association Center for Education. Currently, Anthony is a bilingual doctoral candidate in cultural studies and is also the inaugural graduate student of the anti-racist curatorial practice program. Tonight, we look forward to Anthony sharing perspective that will stretch the limits of how we view religion and spirituality and ways we can engage and foster understanding of one another. Anthony, thank you for kicking us off with a strong start this evening. We're glad you're here. Good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for 
this invitation to be in this space, to begin this night, as the president mentioned, entering Shabbat together in community. I am grateful for the Ripple Conference leadership as well as the leadership at Elon for already a very warm welcome and just a beautiful space. I'm truly honored to be here. My keynote tonight, um, my keynote title tonight is, as we can see here, Living the Interstices, Spiritual Reflections from a Queer Afro-Caribbean Humanist. This talk, and I just, for context, because I don't know if you all saw the beautiful website, um, I'm just gonna provide the context. This talk explores the significance of personal history as a site of knowledge production and world making. In particular, I contextualize the questions that have guided my spiritual and ethical journey, namely towards an embodied intersectional and decolonial humanism, harnessing the potentialities of a personal archive of memory and history that conjures otherwise, modes of being, relating, and understanding towards a liberatory future for all. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Before I start my talk, I want to first acknowledge that part of this keynote is actually a rhizome experience. As the president mentioned, my original um, upbringing in Caguas, Puerto Rico, where I was born and raised, as well as other parts of the continental US, living in Minnesota, living in Florida, um, California, and other places. For my master's, I went to um, Andover Newton Theological School, left, and now I am back in Boston, which is a delight and a surprise to myself. <laughs> Nonetheless, all these experiences have really helped me ponder some of the questions that continue to guide my inquiries and have brought me to this space. Aside from all that academic jargon, I want to acknowledge that I reside specifically um, in the unceded land of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. And to my understanding, here at Elon University sits in the home of the Eno, Tutelo, Shakori, Saponi, and the Okaneshi native people. I want to honor their memories, and I hope that we can continue, hopefully, to develop deeper relationships, collaborations, and understand that we are becoming human together. The title of today's talk is Living in the Interstices, Special Reflections from a Queer Afro-Boricua Humanist. I repeat it often because that is a very good pedagogical tool, especially when introducing very um, complex terms and ideas. However, I will try to deformalize this talk by including glimpses into my journey to humanism, and I invite you to jot down questions that you have either from the talk as well as maybe your own memories, your own stories, your own archives that might be being brought to the surface as we spend um, a few minutes together. Also, a shout out to myself. Um, tomorrow <laughs> at 1.45, I will be giving a talk around humanism of the everyday at Belk 200. Please join or attend any of the other amazing workshops that are gonna be offered. The roadmap for tonight um, is my positionality as a presenter. I'm gonna talk a little bit about humanism, situate the legacy of ancestors in relation to memory, examine the significance of migrations towards subject formation, um, and explore the assemblages among Afro-Caribbean identity, identities, subjectivities, queerness, and spirituality. If I leave anything out, I'm going to be here for the rest of the weekend, so we can definitely over food, coffee, water, or just beautiful sight outside, we can definitely talk some more. First, 
I'm sure that you're curious to know who's before you today, aside from the amazing bio that was read. So I will provide some context on my background, including my social location. What influences my notion of my identity and how I try to live it out, and how I arrive at this topic and this work at large. I'm also coming here not as an authoritative figure on the subject, but rather one who is continuously learning and curious about historical legacies of trauma, reparative modes of relating, and alternative epi epistemes of spirituality, and honoring the some of the titles for this conference, the sacred, remembering um, that we are all, again, constructing, deconstructing, stretching, and uncovering on a daily basis. And next, I will explore the significance of ancestors in Afro-Caribbean spiritual practices, where I'm going to argue that invoking ancestors allows us to access meanings and memories that define, um, that are beyond the bounds of time, place, material body, and our, and our ancestors, again, as a role of memory linking us between our subjectivity and our cosmology, which I think Again, opening um, through Shabbat, again, served, I believe, as a way of really uplifting in a very embodied way. How does memory connect us to people, connect us to identity, connects us to histories and to us? Now, I did share that amazing picture because I think that part of our positionality is, again, allowing for us to understand our embodied realities. A lot of times in the context of higher ed, we're just told you need to learn how to cite and cite good and find the best scholar, practitioner, intellectual that you can and follow on their footsteps and again, cite it at the end, again, in your own words, right? But what happens to our stories, to our narratives? to the experiences that we have had that have brought us to this point. Like I tell some of my students, receiving an admissions letter from any university is just the first step. There's so much more to who you are and who you are becoming that no essay, no paper, no published work can ever truly encompass. However, spaces like this allow for some of us to get a glimpse into each other's stories, to learn that we do not know everything, nor will we. But again, we are brought into spaces because we believe in the potential of stretching our religious, spiritual, ethical, and even cultural beliefs, ideas, and positionalities. So, um, when I talk about humanism, hold on. Sorry. My bad. This happens when you do not memorize stuff. There we go. So my current working definition for humanism can be considered as a continued praxis that connects the theories of everyday life with meaningful practice, especially how do we be together. We think about the complexities, challenges, and, pos and pos possibilities of culture, power, spirituality, our inner life as well as our outer, and ethics. Through humanism, I am invited to ask what will impel us to embody an ethic of the otherwise, to create the liberatory futures we yearn for? To connect, to create, to care, and love in ways never thought, not yet practiced, or embodied before. The picture that I'm sharing here, I think it's fascinating because I am in the board for the Secular Coalition for America, unpaid announcement. Um, <laughs> and if you can see there, I'm also wearing a sweater 
recognizing that I am also connected to AXO, which is the Association for Chaplaincy and Spiritual Life in Higher Ed. Again, holding the tension between the secular and the recognition that in the context of higher ed, we navigate religion, spirituality, ethics, and cultures. How are then these all enmeshed together in, for this particular topic in me, in my life, in my stories? And that means that sometimes as a young person in those spaces, I can say, I am not ashamed, I'm not scared to talk about spirituality to challenge traditional definitions or knowings around spiritualities, religion, ethics, sexuality, queerness, name it, I'll dabble. But it's needed because again, in community is where the, the breath, which is basically my most basic definition for spirituality, individually and collective, begins to generate in order to produce new potentialities. And so if I am not able to sit uncomfortable in these spaces and say, hey, I do not necessarily agree with the statement you made or your own position, can we engage in a conversation where I recognize your differences, hopefully you recognize mine. Regardless of that, I still honor the worth and inherent dignity that you have as a human person, and recognize that over all of these organizations that are there, we're really trying to explore what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human in relationship? What does it mean to be human in creating organizations that are addressing specific niches and specific needs within the spectrum of non-theist communities and organizations across the US and beyond. Oh, well, that was not intentional. So another aspect is talking about our ancestors. And I think that, again, it is crucial for us to begin to engage with our ancestors, those that were once known, as well as those that we never met those whose stories we have not heard or we have not shared. But bracing ourselves with the bravery and the courage to say, I want to understand my own lineage, broadly defined, not just going to 23andMe or any other platform and just looking at data and statistics and placing yourself, but going back to your parents, to your great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents if you have them alive, and going and listening to them. They arrived from somewhere. If you know that story, that is amazing. I do not. I just know since I was born, we were in the island of Puerto Rico, and that's it. However, as the president and all of you maybe have seen on my bio, Right? Through the analysis of cultural studies, that allowed for me to begin to question not only academic and intellectual and philosophical questions, but begin to deconstruct myself. To begin to question identities, positionalities that were imposed on me by family members, as I am read, as I am understood by them, by going to university and you get placed in these particular categories and spaces and identities and then moving across the US and you fit in other categories, some more expansive, others much less. And then asking myself, wait, I am not just me. I am the sum of my parents, of my um, brothers, sisters, chosen family, everything that made me who I am today is an expansion of me and we. 
Now, I do want to expand. Let's not just think about ancestors as those that have transitioned and are no longer here, but also honor and recognize elders as well. Why? Because in spaces like this, in interfaith or interreligious work, humanist work, name it, the path was not paved magically. Someone walked through it, labored on it, sweat on it, maybe even bled on it. But how do we honor that work? Again, by not staying static, by continuing to ask the questions over and over again. And if those questions do not work, then let's sit, let's revisit, let's go back to the whiteboard or any color of the board and begin to see what question is not being asked that I am already embodying, that I am already feeling, that I am experiencing and going through, that maybe even my emotions are allowing me to feel, but I do not have the language or the vocabulary yet. So again, this is why being in spaces like this is so crucial and important. At the same time, when we honor our ancestors and elders, we're also questioning the histories, both that had been taught to us, as well as those histories that have been obscured, either by processes of colonization, or some books that have been banned or erased or discontinued from our libraries, or that we do not have access to because we do not have the economic power or capacity. But hopefully you are in relationship with others that maybe do and can be co-conspirators in that process of honoring your ancestors through your own life and honoring your own self, again, potentially as an elder to be at some point. So when we talk about, in my process of migration and subject formation, I put that beautiful picture of, the, of water, basically, because that is one key component of how I have arrived to today. Being born and raised in Puerto Rico, move, I won't even say the whole story of how many times I have moved in my lifetime. Nonetheless, understanding processes of fluidity, understanding that migration, even when it's done by choice, is still a violent act that is uprooting aspects of who we are. And even when we do find spaces that are life-giving, that are healing, that are expansive and capacious to who we are trying to become, as I have found in my current position at Tufts, that does not negate the fact that I know that I am not home. That I had to take a very huge step to say, I want to pursue a graduate work by myself after finishing undergrad, moving the next day to Massachusetts, a place I had no family, no connection, basically no knowledge aside from like, I like that school, I like that they have housing, and this is where I wanna go. And understanding that that dream and that desire was not alone that I was introduced to aspects of neo-capitalist, to white liberalism, that I did not have the language, the understanding, or acumen to understand what was happening. But I was going through it. I was working as a student. I was a student full time. I needed to eat. I needed to survive. But a lot of times, we do not want to center and uplift those stories. We just want to name and illuminate specific ones, just the accolades, just the amazing parts. But the process of formation of the human, 
of who we are becoming. May it be human, may it be stories, may it be an assemblage. Again, it's not just one dimensional. It encompasses all of the experiences that we have lived. The beautiful ones, the painful ones, maybe even the trauma of our own traditions, religion, spiritualities, that at once we thought was home, was a safe space, and at some point, an aspect of our identity emerged, and maybe there was a bit of tension. Maybe a part of you was erased, obscured, became opaque, or you no longer felt welcome. Maybe you left, maybe you stayed, maybe you powered through. But again, like this beautiful picture, I think it's beautiful. How do we begin to open ourselves to be fluid? To understand that our traditions, if you feel empowered to challenge them, they can be porous. That the sages, that the intellectuals, that the gurus, that the masters, the PhDs, whatever it is, they were human too. They were a product of their time. And so are we. But how do we continue to flow through the multiple streams that are continuously flowing, either through you or along with others? Hopefully to give life. I mean, that's why I'm here. Hopefully through my nonlinear talk you feel a spark of life, that you feel empowered. And if you don't, please pull me aside. We need to try it again. <laughs> but there is hope. There is potential for us to create something more than what we currently have. May it be culturally, spiritually, ethically, religiously. And that's why I am honored to be here in this space with all of you. Because you, to an extent, may it be because you really did say yes, or maybe you're a student or a fellow, and you're forcefully here. <laughs> you still said yes. You chose to be here? OK, good. I like that. <laughs> But I do hope that all jokes aside, we're really able to flow tonight and flow for the rest of the two days that we have left and open ourselves, feel brave, and share stories that we have not heard from you, from your ancestors, if you feel safe or brave to share. Because the work of doing interreligious cooperation, interreligious engagement, is not for the weak of heart. I would say. It takes a lot of courage. It takes even the understanding of saying, you know what? I do not know this aspect of my tradition. I do not know this aspect of my philosophy. I call myself fill in the blank. And you know what? I do not, this core, I do not know this core value. And that is OK. At least, I would say because we are all unfolding in different time, in different spaces, in different contexts. And at least for me, that's what it means to be human. It's allowing us, giving ourselves the permission to feel it all, all of it. When I think about my Afro-Caribbean identity and its subjectivities, as um, I mentioned earlier on, studying cultural studies, something recent as in the last three, four years. So not something that I was born into, not something that I have mastery over, but it was the result of years of <laughs> hitting left, hitting right, 
going through anthropology, going to theology, going to leadership studies, going through humanism, all those nonlinear ways, and finding my home so far in cultural studies, and receiving the power from my mentors, intellectuals, colleagues, to say, you know what? You can do some me search. It is OK to look to you as a site of knowledge production. It is OK for you to begin to understand what does culture mean to you? What does religion mean to you? Spirituality, chaplaincy, you name it. What does it mean to you? And finding the interlocutors for you to engage so that you can continue to unfold and engage in that big question and conversation at the same time. Now, saying that I am Afro-Caribbean or Afro-Boricua is both making multiple statements, but for the purposes of today, I will narrow it down to two. One is challenging the, the reality that Puerto Rico is a colony of the US. It's the oldest colony of the United States. And today, it still reflects a lot of the impact of imperialism, colonization, you name it, you cite it, it's happening. And saying, I recognize that my ancestors, that my elders, that those elders and ancestors that I did not know, that I cannot name, we're here even before I arrived, even before right, we became a colony of the US, recognizing that indigenous people were here first. And that even though our textbooks and other sites of knowledge try to obscure and say, oh, we're just mestizos, we're just everything together, and that's it, and just go on, it is much more complex. It is more, much more challenging. And at the same time, as I've said in other instances tonight, it includes you. Where in the spectrum of becoming more human do you fall in? What category, if any, do you fall in? Which is why Living in the interstices is so important. Recognizing that we're living in the in-between. That no category, no formula, no anthropological framework, no sociological formula can really encompass any peoples, any society, any civilization. That there are stories, that there are narratives, that there are archives that have never been accessed and will never probably be accessed, or never make it to the textbook or to our tables. But they existed. And maybe through the knowledge and passing down of your own family lineage, you might have heard some of those stories. But you know what? Maybe we do not share it. Maybe not even to our own selves because we decide to take other categories, other framework, other identities that make me more palatable, that make me more likable, more passable, more legible, or gives me access to more spaces of power. Let's name it. But are you whole? Are you becoming more free? Are you helping others become more free? When one claims a specific positionality, like I've been doing for the past few years, it is not a walk in the park. It is not always beautiful. It's being met with others that say, you are too, and you are too, or maybe not enough of this, not enough of that. But when do we challenge those voices, those stories, in our own cultural narrative or in our own 
traditions, spiritualities, philosophies. To say, you do not fully define me, but I can be in conversation because I will not erase you. And that way, beginning to embody and live in the interstices, living in the in-between, while others may not. But I hope that you can honor those processes, that know that it's not a place that you say, I have arrived and I'm done. It is a lifelong journey. It takes stepping beyond the bounds of feeling safe, of feeling secured, or holding mastery over narratives and stories, and saying there is so much more. My colleagues, my friends, my neighbors have other stories. Am I willing to listen? Do I want to listen? Your formation is not just here at Elon, it's not just at Tufts, it's not just in higher ed. Life itself is a process of multiple formations that a lot of times are happen happening at the same time. that a lot of times is saying, no, we're not starting in winter break or spring break or during the summer or when you have time. Life is constantly either inviting you or forcing you to question yourself or even question that which you do not yet know. And are we listening? Or if you're not listening, I hope your body is telling you. And you can begin to develop those modes and methods to begin to read, to understand, to sense your body. What is your body telling you? And if that is not part of your tradition or your experience, well, I hope that this talk serves as the doorway for you to begin your own journey. And I hope that this conference helps you to sit with people that you have not yet met, maybe don't like as much, or whose traditions you do not fully understand. Because again, engaging in interreligious interfaith work interreligious cooperation, it's not just at the religious or theological level. At the core, it's at the human level. It's at the human condition. And then, of course, we began philosophies, ethics, spiritualities. Well, I feel that I have spoken a lot, <laughs> so I am definitely going to just take a small pause and open up for questions, quandaries, pushbacks. And then if we feel the energy, I can close off with the queer politics. Um, as you said, this has been very nonlinear and awesome, but as someone who does very well uh, with like direct things, I was wondering if I could put you on the spot to give us maybe a specific uh, definition of what is humanism and how can you practice it? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's so many definitions and to be totally honest, I have not found one that I truly feel 100% that I can endorse, which is, why I start, which is why I started the presentation by stating what my definition of humanism was. Because I have found through my own experience, my own encounters, 
engaging for so many years in humanism, a lot of times it's mainly through white imagination, through white antics, white knowings, that we are defining a Western understanding of what humanism is, which is why I do not see myself represented in that definition. And as such, I usually do not cite it. But if you go to the American Humanist Association, there's more than 50 definitions that are there spanning through decades and centuries of human thought that can give you a definition. Um, one definition, though, that I will provide is from a mentor of mine, Dr. David Breeden, who's the senior minister of the Unitarian Universalist Society in Minneapolis, that states that humanism is an invitation for inner dialogue and inner conversation, and then with others. And so that's one definition that I'm like, I actually like that, because it is inviting you, again, to move beyond the philosophical dimension, to inviting us to say, I need to be in relation with others. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, if you do come to my presentation tomorrow, I, I do <laughs> unpack a bit more. Any other questions? Is it on? Okay. Um, so I know, oh my god. <laughs> so I know when you're talking about the, um, your, and the, on the ancestor slide that you said, um, we're not just ourselves, but we're a sum of, of our biological family and our chosen family as well. Um, how do you think that balances out when maybe like you have family that isn't totally accepting of your identity, um, identities of your chosen family, and yeah, just how do you think that balance plays out? Yeah, I really don't have an answer. <laughs> I think that that's the boundaries of chaplaincy, I would say. I think that I can define for you, how do you relate with your, your family, your chosen family? How much violence, how much erasure, um, emotional abuse, or what have you, right? Not just the negative, but all of that. How much of that you want to engage in, in your own time, when you go on vacation, or in specific times? So it's up to you. I think that you define your boundaries and you decide how much do you want to give up yourself. And if parts of yourself are not being accepted, are not being embraced, I would say very colloquially, like it's their loss. But I hope that you do not diminish yourself in order to feel accepted or welcome or for the pleasantries of it, because you might know that you're not, or aspects of you are not. Right? So it, it would be up to you to say, do I just want to continue to replicate this, or do I want to create something different? Hi, I'm just um, wondering if you could share something that maybe you've been able to do as a humanist chaplain on your campus to help students see and start to deconstruct, or in which ways have been really successful in helping students start to deconstruct the colonialism in their own education while you're still encouraging them through their education. Yeah. <laughs> just like real quick, Thank no you. big deal. <laughs> Thank you for naming that. Um, and, and thank you for feeling comfortable to, to raise that right in this space. Because I think that at, in one of the core levels, human beings are sites of contradiction. Right? We say that we uphold all these ethics, all these values, all these amazing, beautiful things. And yet, sometimes we do not. But to answer your question, I mean, um, with my dear colleague, Dr. Peter Banerjee, who's the Hindu chaplain um, at Tufts, and myself, we have held for maybe two years um, an unlearning retreat. And basically, it is a curated space for 
um, students from the global majority to come together to the Interfaith Center by other scholars, intellectuals, and, and practitioners um, from the global majority or um, BIPOC. And again, feel free, feel empowered to name some of the issues that they are going through, to understand that even though they're trying to power through these neo-capitalist forms of like, I need to be in production all the time, right? That there are spaces within the university that are really trying to see you in your whole expensive self. Might not be every space, unfortunately, but there are spaces that are willing to say, we want to accompany you. We recognize that in order to be successful in this world, we need to amass all these degrees and all these titles and accolades and all this work. And yet, can we at the same time create other ways? Can we speak multiple cultural and linguistic right, rhetoric and vocabulary in order to deconstruct and then construct something else? And then if we are not able to deconstruct it, then maybe we need to co-design other spaces where we are able to do it. Recognizing that, of course, if you go that route, well, it's a lot of work. But it can be done. Did that answer? Do you want more? I have more examples, but. Hi, um, I would, my question is kind of like related, I guess, how would you combat, how do you combat burnout within like these topics? Because it's very, very hard to have conversations about it. And burnout does come very easily to some who, for, to most, like to all. Um, but <laughs> how would you combat that or how do you deal with that? when approaching these topics. Yeah, I mean, I can give you this example right now. I had a beautiful presentation, and I woke up at three in the morning, and all my flights got canceled, and I arrived at four. And I'm like, you know what, I'm hungry, dizzy, exhausted, but we need to do this work. We need to come into the space. And so I defaulted then to just being myself and just sharing with you what I feel that I'm reading into the space, into the room. I think that naming burnout as not something that's just said constantly, but that it's actually that we feel, that we process, that we sense, and that it actually has become a psychological concept right within the field, that it is OK to go to the policies of the university, which are there, and say, I think I need an extension. I think I need an academic leave. I think I need to talk to my professor. And if I have not talked to the professor ever, I think today is the day. <laughs> because hopefully, again, we understand, or at least I understand, the work we're doing at Tufts, that we're an ecosystem. That if you're hurting, I'm hurting. That if you're going through moments of trauma, of violence, of pain, and I'm not able to accompany you, at least as a humanist chaplain, what am I doing? And if I can't accompany you, you, be, you better know that I will find within the spectrum of the ecosystem other colleagues that I'm in relationship with that I can then say, please accompany this student. Because I can, or I don't have the skills, right, or, or the boundaries of my job, right? Um, the limit mean in certain aspects. But you're more than a number. And I say that as someone who has multiple student IDs. <laughs> you are more than that. You're more than the degrees. You're more than that ideal profession that you have in your mind. But you have to give yourself the permission to say, I need to rest. Might not be Shabbat, though today it is. But I want to rest. And recognizing that rest is an act of defiance. That rest is an act of liberation. It is an act of saying, 
enough is enough, I need to recharge. Because if you are burning out, you cannot give the best of yourself. One more question, and maybe I'll just go very quickly through the queer politics. Um, okay, um, so my question was something that you said that like really resonated was this idea of like doing some me search, like amidst all of the hard work that you do, and and you know we we've been talking so much about how much energy interfaith work takes sometimes, and I was wondering um, if you could share any strategies or approaches that you've taken to really exploring and building your own identity while you're helping so many people do the same thing. Mm. Yeah, I feel that that's a question that I'm always bringing to the center, actually. I mean, I have amazing students, whom some that are like student students and some that are fellows or are collaborating with me more closely that are still students, but I think we have a more intimate relationship, right, of sharing power within initiatives and works that we're doing, and yet one of the ways, for example, that I try to honor and sustain that is saying, hey, like, what are your, I don't say strengths and weaknesses, but, you know, what do you do very well? If we're, for example, right now we're um, constructing and designing a project around violence, um, and it's the Humanist Chaplaincy with the American Humanist Association and Humanist International, which is a global international organization, addressing multiple um, aspects and strategies around violence, right? And saying, hey, student, like, what are you really great at? This, this, and this. What are you not so great at? This and this and this. Thank you for letting me know because I will not ask stress. I will not, right, go to the areas of lack of your life and say, hey, if you're not good at creating a flyer, please create me a beautiful flyer for our promotion, right? I will not do that. I will outsource to someone else because I also recognize that there are aspects of me where I need right, to either become better at it, where I'm really great at, but because we're co-designing together, right, it's always this exchange, it's always this give and take, that it takes a lot of work and a lot of trust because it's not so often done, um, especially in, in spaces of higher ed. Right? So it's a lot of repetition, it's a lot of coming back and saying, let's revisit again <laughs> this aspect. Right? Because again, when we are doing programming, my philosophy is that we're not just doing programming for the sake of it, we're actually trying to create systems and spaces right, that are life-giving, that are inviting you to an experience, to a cultural, ethical, philosophical experience. And if we're not able for us to engage in that work, then we won't be able to embody that and thus create Right, that aesthetic. So I'll go very quick. <laughs> so the use of the term queer spans multiple disciplines and is notably used as a re rhetorical tool facilitating questions of how rather than what. The various designations of the term including, quote, a strategy, an attitude, a reference, to other identities and a new self-understanding allows for the possible, sorry, for the possibilities to rethink and examine of lived experiences. Which is why in some of my work and presentations I'm always stressing queerness, right? And some people might say, why do you always have to center X, Y, and Z? And I say, well, because it's not just a dimension of identity, it's also a site of knowledge, it's also a lived reality, it's an experience, it's a community. And so when I show up into spaces, maybe I don't have the time to go, right, lay that out like that, but that is what I'm trying to do. And so it is really important for you what identities, what rhetorics, what positionalities?
do you hold as key, as important, that you cannot live without, that you could potentially begin to invite others to explore? And then I will do one more slide very quickly. Um, again, as we're trying to hopefully expand and stretch um, our religious understandings. Um, spirituality is an epistemological structure that acknowledges intentional ways to think of the interstices of culture, identity, of being differently. It is accessible and intervenes in the everyday life, my favorite word. It is a force that creates. It is a force for interdependence. And it, and it acknowledges that in order to flourish, we have to work in collective. And so I will close with a meditation that I wrote a few years ago, so it was not recent. We who are nurtured in conjunto or togetherness and are moved in our becoming by the stories, shared experiences, and memories of our ancestors. Let us not forget the millions that pisadas, steps, pressed on the surface of this earth where we wandered, wandered, and journeyed without human-made borders. Through the many shifts and reconfigurations of our modern societies, let us seek and desire a relationality that fosters collective flourishing in order to sustain a cycle that humanizes each other and embraces with sacred curiosity our lived experiences. Ashe. Thank you. <laughs>